ज्ञानम परमम ध्येयम नॉलेज इज सुप्रीम Welcome to MOOC course on applications of interactomics using genomics and proteomics technologies. In last lecture, Dr. Josh Lebert gave you an overview of proteomics field and to perform high throughput proteomics based experiment, they need to generate the clone repositories and to achieve the high throughput biology and performing proteomics experiment what are the key considerations you need to pay attention for generating those clone repositories. Once you have obtained large number of gene clones, now you are ready to perform many experiments. And one such experiment was developed in his lab which is a novel protein microarray technology which is NAPA or nucleic acid programmable protein arrays. To perform NAPA, if you have these clone repositories available, you have large number of cDNA clones available, you can print them on the chip and imagine that what goes on in our body to do the central dogma, the transcription and translation process from the genes to RNA and the proteins. The same cascade of event could we try to reproduce, could we try to replicate on the chip itself and that was the concept of NAPA. From the DC DNA sequences printed on the glass slides, could we add the machinery which is required for in vitro transcription and translation and use those to synthesize the protein on the chip itself. Looks science fiction, but it was a reality. Dr. Josh Reber and one of his senior postdocs, Dr. Niroshan Ramachandran, they made this technology for performing high throughput protein microarrays using NAPA. Today Dr. Laber will talk to you about the development of this NAPA technology and how to use this for various microarray based applications. So, let us welcome Dr. Laber for his lecture on NAPA technologies. All right, so we're, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna start now by talking a little bit about the, the NAPA method, right? And I already, I already spent some time talking to you about um, the gene cloning part, right? So that's how do you make the clones for the genes that you're gonna put on your protein arrays. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit today about NAPA production and I'm gonna do it a little bit from a historical perspective. So how did we come about this method and how does it generally work? Um, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to do discovery on, on the platform and then finally uh, nothing you do works if you don't go back and validate it. So that's kind of like the whole end to end process. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about protein microarrays, right? What, what are they and, and why do we want to do them? And I'm going to point out that um, these are a number of the people that were most responsible for doing this work. Nero Ramachandran was really the leader in our group that really pioneered this methodology. Um, Jeannie Hainsworth was the engineer who did a lot of the work and then some of these folks also contributed to some of the early methodology. So we talked earlier about how having a, a library of expression clones would allow you to do um, all kinds of different studies. Well here's one that we got very interested in which is biochemistry. If you want to study the biochemistry of a protein, um, you need to be able to make that protein and, and do experiments. And, and if you want to be able to do it times thousands, then that's what led us to the idea of protein microarrays. And just to give you some perspective, when we first began this work, we actually started by trying to do high throughput protein purification. And so we were developing methods to make proteins in bacteria, lice bacteria, capture the proteins on, on columns, elute the proteins and then study them in high throughput. And believe it or not we still do some of that work for other reasons. 
But we realized very quickly that it's hard to do high throughput protein purification. That uh, if, you, um, if you try to isolate lots and lots of proteins, um, first of all, a lot of the proteins don't purify well. Secondly, the ones, most of the proteins don't give you very high yield. And then third, you don't really know if the proteins that you're purifying are going to be of, of high quality folded, you know, and active. So that's what led us to this idea of protein microarrays. Now there are two kinds of protein arrays. The first kind, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, are these antibody arrays where you, you print an array on a, a microscope slide, you put antibodies down that recognize different proteins on them, and then you use those arrays to probe a sample to capture whatever proteins are in that sample as a way of measuring the levels of those proteins in the sample. So the goal of this array is to measure the levels of proteins. The protein arrays that I'm going to talk about are called target protein arrays. And the goal for these protein, these arrays are to look at the proteins themselves. What do they do? Who do they interact with? How do they fold? What is their function? So um, the idea on these slides is that you have a slide and each of these different spots represents a different protein on the array. So lots of things that you can do with a target protein array. You can look at drug specificity. I'll show you an example of that later. You can do biomarker discovery. You can do enzyme substrate sub identification. You can do interaction domain mapping. You can do um, analysis of how protein mutate, of gene mutations affect the function of the proteins. You can look at off target protein interactions. So here's an example of what that might look like. Imagine if you had a fluorescently tagged molecule and you probe the array. You can see which protein that, that, that molecule targets. Or if it turns out that it binds to multiple proteins, you might get it binding to multiple proteins and you might see the differences in the binding and that would give you some sense of its specificity. This is the area that, that I've spent a lot of my career on and that is looking for patterns of binding that indicate the presence of disease. I told you yesterday that we were looking to do um, uh, look for markers for breast cancer, right? And we did that by looking at the immune response to those markers. So imagine you take this uh, serum and you apply it against uh, in the affected individuals or the normal individuals. Now, I've shown that a number of spots light up and I did that for a reason. It turns out that even normal people develop antibodies against some proteins. The problem is that the word normal is in quotes. It's in quotes because all of us have medical histories. We may not have cancer, but we have had other things in our lifetime. And those things can affect your immune system, and those things can give responses. So the key here is to know which responses correlate to cancer, and which responses are not related to cancer, right? Um, and so you have to ex accept the fact that there will be these other responses. Um, and then the idea is you do variety of informatics processing to take these, compare these to these, and look for patterns like this one here that's present in everybody. Uh, look for these guys that occur only in the affected individuals, and then there will be some that are just random variation that occur from, from person to person. So that's, so that's another approach that we're doing. So, so let's start here by asking the question, what are the ideal qualities that we want in a protein array? What would make an array a really good array? So I would argue the first thing has to be high density. The whole point of a protein array is to get lots of different proteins in a very small space so you can study it. Of course you want to be able to work with small volumes. Um, the advantage of a protein array is that you can take only a couple hundred microliters or a few microliters of serum and test thousands of proteins with that, with that amount. Of course, it needs to be multifunctional. You'd be able to be able to test it with lots of activities. But then you, you also want it to have natural folding. You want the proteins on the array to look like they do in normal circumstances. And ideally, they would be made in, in a milieu similar to the one in which they normally occur. You don't want to have to purify the proteins because if you have to purify the proteins, then you're going to end up with um, 
all the things that can occur during protein purification proteins could lose their folding they could get low yield they may not be in, in the proper conformation um, you obviously want to be able to test as many different repositories as possible so you want to be able to test any proteins that you'd like and you'd, you'd like the, the to not worry about the shelf life of the protein once you print the protein on a chip there's always this worry that the clock is starting and the longer it sits there the more likely it is to stop being active or being well folded all right so and of course you want the levels of protein from one to the other to be very consistent those are the things that you'd really like all right so so this is the array type that we're going to talk about today which is called NAPA for nucleic acid programmable protein array and the idea for NAPA is that we print the gene for the protein on the chip and we store the chip as a DNA chip so the gene is there the clone the ones that we talked about in the first half of today is on the chip along with an agent that's going to capture the protein when it's made but the protein hasn't been made yet then on the day of the experiment we add a cell free extract make the protein and capture it and then we we display the protein at that time fresh and so the idea of NAPA is that we can do all kinds of studies on it we can do interactions with specific protein queries we can do en enzyme substrate modification we can even build multi, multi protein complexes so let me begin at the beginning by showing you the, the idea behind NAPA before it was actually on a protein array so here what we're looking at is just making proteins using cell free extract in the wells of a 96 well dish okay and so um, the proteins that we make all have a GST tag at the C terminus remember we talked about you always have to have a tag so these guys all have a tag and so if we if we make the protein in these wells and we probe them with an antibody that recognizes the tag they all light up right but if we probe them with antibodies that are specific to each individual protein then only the p21 lights up at p21 only the 16 lights up at 16 only the FOS and so on and so forth so um, depending on what you use as your antibody you only get that signal now you can use the same approach to look at, at interaction queries in this case here's a bunch of different proteins on a chip right and in chip I mean in quotes because these are actually the wells of a 96 well dish um, if I probe with the protein p21 it binds to all these CDKs it binds to these cyclins it binds to um, these guys here and it binds uh, actually to itself again so um, th those are the interactors for p21 if you probe with a different query in this case CDK4 it's going to bind to the cyclin D's and it's going to bind to P16 and if I probe with P16 it's going to it's going to pick up these CDKs so you can see using different queries I get different interactors and again this is not a microscopic array this is a 96 well dish well of course um, the advantage of this is now I don't have to express these proteins or purify them um, they were made using um, mammalian extracts um, the levels of proteins were consistent on, the, on this chip um, they were made at the time of the experiment so I made the proteins and I tested them minutes later um, and of course I could do this general approach using any kind of cDNA if I can clone the gene and make the cDNA I can make the protein array and then um, uh, we, we talked about the multifunctionality um, and, and of course users can modify this as they need to um, but there are still some challenges so um, we need to make we need to now take it from this format which is on 96 well dishes and we had to get it onto a microscopic chip we had to be able to print it on slides so that we could do thousands at a time so we had to be able to deal with very low amounts of protein we need to make at least 10 femtograms of protein we had to get capture that was rapid we had to find arrays that were compatible with standard array readers at the time we really wanted to work on a single slide format um, that, that, that where we could add the extract to the whole slide we didn't want to have to manufacture these specialized um, uh, methods for expressing in little tiny wells or something like that I'm going to come back to that because we now are moving in that direction but at the time we really wanted this to be very simple 
And of course we had to avoid crosstalk from, from, from spot to spot. So let me talk about the technology. So most people who build protein arrays do it by purifying the proteins first. Um, they, they, they do what we started with, which was this high throughput purification kind of technology. Uh, and they do it in 96 well plates or even 384 well plates. Um, but they have a couple of problems. First of all, um, you get very highly variable protein yields. So the amount of protein that you get from, from uh, uh, one protein to the next can change over four logarithms. So four orders of magnitude of difference. They, they get, um, they're working typically in heterologous systems. So they're either purifying in bacteria or they're purifying from yeast or they're purifying from insect cells. And that in and of itself introduces some differences. And of course the biggest concern I have is array shelf life. So you purify the protein, you store the protein, then you take the protein out, then you print the protein, and then you store the printed protein. So you have a lot of steps in there, and all of those are opportunities for proteins to lose their shape, lose their folding, and not be as functional. And of course, some proteins will stay fine during all that process, and other proteins will not. And you never know which ones they are. There's no way to tell which ones are the good ones and the bad ones. So this is the idea behind NAPA. In, in the case of NAPA, what we do is we print the gene on a plasmid. We add cell-free extract that makes the protein. And this is meant to show that we have the protein in blue and then a GST tag in red. And then here's a different protein in yellow and a GST tag in red. So we make this at the time of the experiment. And then what's going to happen is, um, yeah, I just told you that, is that the GST is going to get captured by the anti-GST antibody. And now you're displaying the protein on the surface. So it, it flips upside down so that the protein part is what's facing up. Make sense? And then this is what it looks like. Here's an early array. Um, uh, printed eight different proteins, 64 times each. And here we probe with anti-GST. That's, th that's a way of measuring how much total protein we have on the array. And so all of them light up. And then if we probe it with anti-P21, just remember the little 96 well plate, same idea, now we only get the P21 lighting up. All right? And I already kind of covered these, inter these, these advantages, uh, pretty much the same ones here, so I won't go over them again. All right, so, so here's how we first tested this. We started, decided to do protein-protein interactions. So imagine that you have three different spots on your array. In fact, we had we had many more than that, but let's just talk about three. This one makes the yellow protein, the red protein, and the blue protein. And these are the genes, these are DNA. And then here's the antibody that's going to capture the GST. Now we want to we ask, do any of these three proteins interact with the pink protein? All right? And, the, and in, the case, in this case, what we're doing is we're going to add the gene for the pink protein in the solution along with these guys which are attached to the surface. So these guys are bound to the spot. Th this is free to go anywhere it wants. We then express the protein, right? And these three proteins are going to get captured to the surface of the array because they have the GST tag. So that's going to lock them down to their spot. But this does not have a GST tag, so it's going to float everywhere on the s with, uh, across the array. And then over time, if you give it time, the query protein will bind to the target proteins if it recognizes them. In this case, it binds to this guy, but not these guys. Right? And so now I can wash away anything that's not bound. And I'm left now with this guy bound to this spot. Now, how do I know where it binds? Well, I know the identity of every spot on the array. I know whatever position it is, which gene it is. And so I know that if this spot lights up, that pink binds to red. Right? And I can detect that interaction with an antibody that has a fluorescent marker on it that will recognize either a tag on the pink protein or it can recognize the pink protein itself. Now, there's all kinds of variations you can do here. Um, it, you could use click chemistry to look at interactions, and we've done that. You can um, uh, 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 have you know, other molecules that interact with this guy, avidin and biotin, lots of different strategies. But the bottom line is,
as long as you can recognize the query protein you can determine where the binding occurred. So our first experiment was this guy. We took all the proteins in the human DNA replication complex. Uh, these are the, this is um, that collection there. Cloned all those genes and then we printed them and expressed them. And this is measuring with GST just to show that they all got made. Okay. And everybody was done in duplicate. So they were all there in two spots. And then we, we would query the array using an antibody using this protein here. One of the proteins in the set, MCM2. And, and then you can see that MCM2 binds to ORC5, ORC6, ORC and MCM3. And here it is binding to these guys over here. And of course it does it in duplicate so we know it's, we're confident of the, of the result. You can do the same thing with a different protein. This is ORC3. And again it's binding to certain proteins but not other proteins. So you have every other protein on the array is sort of a negative control. Right? And you can merge the two images if you wanted to and even build, use that kind of thing to build an interaction map for all the proteins in the complex with all the other proteins. And that's effectively what we did. We identified, um, we, we queried over a thousand possible interactions. We identified 110 of them including many new ones using this general approach. So you can use this to kind of look at protein protein interactions. And of course you're not restricted to looking at full length proteins. If you want to map the binding domain of specific parts of proteins, you can do that. So in this case, we were looking at um, where does this protein geminin bind to this protein CDT1. So we took CDT1 and we made a series of different deletions, right? And we showed that all of them were expressed on the array. And then we probed them with geminin, which interacts with them. And you can see that geminin binds to some of them, but it doesn't bind to others. So that gives you some sense of where the binding site is, right? This line here, if that, if this part of the protein was present, then it always bound. And so that allows you to map quickly where two proteins may talk to each other. And then um, Nero went back and made a very small version of this guy and showed that it was sufficient for binding. Um, the other thing that you can do if you want to play with these arrays is you can actually, you can look at the possibility of multiple proteins interacting together. So we knew that um, CDT1 bound to the MCM complex. We could tell that by looking, because of biochemical studies that have been done before we got involved. But we did not see um, CDT1 directly interacting with any of the proteins over here. This is a map that came from that big map I showed you and what we did, what we figured out was that although CDT did not bind to any of these proteins, it did bind to this protein and this protein bound to that protein. So maybe this protein here is acting like a bridge protein. It's holding CDT1 in connection with that complex, right? So the question was could we test that on the arrays? Right? And we did that by, by doing a couple of things. We, we could probe um, M MCM2 we knew was in this complex. So we probed MCM2 against CDT1 either with CDC6 or without it. Um, and we as a control had MCM5 and we also had um, a negative control CDC45. And, and this is just to show you what that looks like. This just shows you that all the proteins were made on the array. If we add MCM2 um, without CDC6, you don't see any binding here. But you do see the positive control MCM5 indicated. If you add MCM2 plus CDC6, now, now you can see the CDT1 binding. It's pretty faint. I'm not sure you can see it where you are, but we definitely observed it. Okay. So um, well, uh, we're, we're going to spend more time later in the course talking about the high density arrays, but I want to give you a flavor. Of, of what we had to do to get now from these arrays, which I showed you, showed had around, you know, 50 proteins on them. The goal, of course, I told you from the beginning was to get to thousands. So how do we adapt the platform to get to thousands? So, um, uh, uh, yeah, so we were working in sort of dozens range. We need, we, we were, we, at those days we were using maxi prep DNA. If you're going to do thousands of proteins, and you remember that what we need to make is DNA, not protein. 
And that's advantageous because it's easier to make DNA than protein, easier to purify it, and much easier to quantify how much you've made. But still, as easy as it is to make DNA, if you want to do an array of 10,000 proteins, then you have to prepare 10,000 DNAs. So you need to, you, you can't do that by maxi prep. You have to be working at small scale that's reproducible and reliable, yeah? Um, we were using this streptavidin biotin uh, chemistry to do our arrays at the beginning. And that clearly was not going to work because uh, uh, it's expensive and it, it involved having to stick them in the UV box for a while. It was really kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah, the UV cross-linking part was uh, cumbersome. Um, uh, and we needed to do some optimization and we needed to increase our content. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the optimization experiments that were done. You're going to learn how to make these arrays using our current approach. Um, but um, we spent a lot of time working on the high density printing, developing a better capture chemistry, figuring out how to make DNA in high throughput, and, and figuring out how to detect the interactions in a, in a more ready and easy way. And this is sort of the result of all that work. What you're looking at is kind of our current version of, of what we do most of the time for Napa now. On the left is one of our typical arrays, around 2300 genes or proteins printed on the array. Um, the, the signal you're looking at here is the DNA signal. So we stain the chip every time we make one for DNA and that tells us that our printing was good, right? Because remember what we're printing is DNA. So if we stain for pico, with pico green and we see even staining, that means that we did a good job of printing even amounts of DNA. Then we convert it to protein and we measure it with anti-GST and that tells us how much protein we have on the array. And that tells us that not only did we print well, but we can express and capture the protein as well. All right? And that's what this plot shows you here. In the x-axis is DNA signal, that's the pico green. In the y-axis is GST signal, that's the amount of protein made. A couple things that you can observe here. First of all, in terms of the x-axis, the vast majority of our spots line up very evenly around this area here. That means that we do a pretty good job of printing the same amount of DNA for every spot. And that's encouraging, it means our printing is good. Um, you'll see that there's a few down here that did not print well, and so it's good to know that. Secondly, if you look at the, from the top of the expression to the bottom of the expression, the entire range is with, within one order of magnitude. So instead of those protein arrays where you would have the lowest amount of protein to the highest amount of protein being over four orders of magnitude, now all of our protein is within a single order of magnitude. In fact, 93% of these spots are within twofold of the mean which means that we're getting very even levels of protein on the chip. And that's exactly, remember, that one of the things we wanted from an ideal array was to have very consistent even levels of protein. And just to give you some better sense of that, here's quantification based on different types of proteins. Um, going from weakest to strongest, and then um, this line here represents the, low, the lower end of detection, and this is the higher end of detection. Uh, uh, no, no, that's not true here. I'm sorry. The, it's right here. I don't have that on this graph. This is just uh, two, uh, uh, signal intensity. But you can see that um, we get, by and large, 96% uh, of transcription factors were detectable, 97% of kinases. Membrane proteins are very detectable. And then small, medium, and large proteins are all detectable. So roughly speaking, about 97% of whatever we print, we can get good expression of. Occasionally, we'll run into proteins that have unusual amino acid sequences that make it difficult to get high yield. But that is by far the exception. So this is, um, uh, this is the method that we use to purify the DNA, or uh, that I should say the method that we used to use. Um, those of you who know Sanjeeva, this is when he was in the lab, this is how he did it. Um, this is uh, um, an automated platform. Um, we had worked out using a robot how to do DNA mini preps using robots. Um, and that allowed us to do, if you were really working hard, about 600 uh, uh, a day in a sort of a team approach. Um, that, that was not easy, but you could do it. Just to give you some frame of reference, when I did DNA mini preps in my day, if you did 50 in a day, you were working your butt off. 
Um, uh, but with robots you could get up to around 600. Okay, since then in Arizona now we have this technology. So we've taken that robot technology which was we used to call it sneaker net which is you connect one robot to the other by a graduate student who runs from one to the other to an, a fully automated platform. And let me see if I can make this go. Did that, is that going? Yeah. So this is what we have in Arizona now. Um, in the basement where my lab is located. This is a fully automated, uh, automated platform for growing DNA and purifying it. The camera is sitting on an incubator shaker that grows the bacteria with the DNA in it. Um, this particular shaker has a specialized door in the back so that these robot arms here can reach in and take out each one at a time as it needs to and they can put, they, they pass it back and forth on that platform there. So he, this guy is handing it off to this guy. So he's going to pick it up now. But they can pass it back to the centrifuge which is right there. Um, there's also a freezer which is right over here that stores the pellets after they've been grown. And then this liquid robot over here will purify the DNA from the bacterial pellets. Um, you can see this guy's mixing by turning it upside down just the way you would invert a plate. Right, so the robots can do that for you if you want them to. Um, and of course we have um, sealers and peelers to seal the plate so they don't spill. Barcode reader, there's a barcode reader right down here which you can't see that checks the barcode of every plate to make sure that it's what's supposed to be. And then the, this, this device over here will read the, the optical density of the DNA after you've made the DNA, the OD260. So we can actually measure how much DNA we're making and we can, the robots will automatically adjust the concentration to make them what you want them to be. So all in all, we went from doing 50 mini preps a day to 600 mini preps a day to now 4,600 mini preps in 70 hours, start to finish growing bacteria to getting purified DNA. So it really accelerates what you do and it also gives you a little bit more um, certainty that you, what you're doing is working. So this is how we actually make the chips. Um, and I think you guys have examples of this at your desks. Um, you have this cover slip here that you put on the chip. Um, you, there's a little hole here and a little hole here. <coughs> you inject your lysate in here, you fill it all up, make sure you don't get any bubbles. That's always the trick. One of the things you have to learn how to do. And then you'll, you can make the proteins on the chip using this approach. Um, this just indicates that you can um, map uh, a more high uh, higher throughput version of mapping where binding occurs. Here's an example of an antibody that was binding to the P53 protein. We did a series of N-terminal deletions and you can see it binds to all of them until it gets to here. We did C-terminal deletions and again it binds to here and then you don't see it. And we did fragments that walk across the protein and of course it binds to just that one there. So there's been a couple of, of, of advances that, that have occurred in the last, I would say several years. When we first started this work we were using reticulocyte lysate from, from rabbits to make proteins. That was the expression lysate that we used to make proteins. And I will say that still works okay. Um, this is what that looks like. So you've been seeing arrays that look like this now most of the day. Um, blue is okay expression, green is better expression, orange is really good expression, red is like amazing expression, okay? So that gives you some flavor of the thing. And we were quite happy with this, um, but then the patent ended on that and new companies came out and a new version of lysate came out that was made from human cells. The advantage of the human lysate was that it, it came from a purified cell line. So you didn't have to get so much variation from animal to animal. And this is what the signal looked like. Just unbelievable signal, about 15 times stronger than we could get from the rabbit lysate. This is whole human extract that includes human ribosomes and human chaperone proteins, which means that, the, that it, there are proteins in the lysate that help these proteins fold in their, natural, in their natural shape. The other advantage of the human lysate is that it's less likely to inhibit um, immune reactions. So one of the problems that we used to see with rabbit retic lysate was every once in a while when we were looking at, this is a person who was vaccinated with an antibody to, these, to this anthrax, um, that even after a vaccine, we saw no response on the chips. 
if we made the same chip with human lysate <coughs> we saw very good responses probably what's happening is in the human lysate I mean in the rabbit lysate there are because it's from blood there may be inhibitors of immune response there and those were blocking it on the chips but the human lysate comes from a purified cell line there's no immune system around and so you don't get that problem so I'm going to show you just uh, a couple of applications of this ap approach and then um, uh, maybe, maybe even just one so um, we've talked about immune responses the classic immune response is by ELISA where you you coat the well of a 96 well dish with your protein you add serum to the the the, the wells and then here's a patient who had a strong response and here's a patient who had no response uh, of course if you do ELISA's you're doing one protein at a time it typically requires a lot of protein to do that and and um, uh, and some proteins are very hard to make to begin with so of course what we'd like to do is this take a chip that displays thousands of proteins do that okay so the idea is you probe a chip with um, serum and then various spots on the chip light up and we've talked about all of these different types of assays so I won't belabor that so so let me give you one example we'll talk about more as the course goes on this is um, pathogen proteins right and um, what you're looking at here I remember I mentioned tularemia when we, you asked your question that is the entire proteome of Francisella tularensis in fact it's the entire proteome in duplicate so we got them all onto a single array so because um, uh, we in the end we got that to work these five chips are cholera so um, vibrio cholera and then this chip here is just outer membrane proteins from an organism called Pseudomonas aeruginosa which is the organism that causes pseudomonal pneumonias it's a leading cause of death in patients who have a disease called cystic fibrosis I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this guy so there's around 300 proteins on there uh, we were working with a collaborator when we were in Boston um, Steve Laurie was interested in identifying developing a vaccine against pseudomonas because this was the leading cause of death in patients with with CF and also a major cause of death of patients in, in the hospital who are uh, intubated who are otherwise um, immune compromised this is an organism by the way that we've all been exposed to it's in the environment all the time most of us if we're healthy don't get infections but under certain circumstances you get infections so um, he his idea was the, the proteins on the outer membrane of the bacteria are the most likely to be inducing an immune response and, and to respond to uh, a vaccine so he wanted to look at which of those proteins was immunogenic his idea was he was going to purify those proteins and then test them now if you've ever tried to purify a, a, a membrane protein you know how difficult that is it's hard to purify proteins in general but purifying membrane proteins is a is a nightmare and so he he boldly went ahead to clone to, to purify 300 of these and I think he got four all right so we suggested try the array because we knew the arrays can make membrane proteins pretty well and in fact they did so here's the chip the DNA stain here's the chip the the protein stain you notice that they're all red and they're all expressed so the membrane proteins were well made on the chip and then we probed them with patient serum and you can see that this patient is responding to certain protein on the chip so then you can ask the question well are there common responses because if you're going to make a vaccine you want it to be one that's common that works for most people yeah so here he took a number of patients with cystic fibrosis who had documented pseudomonal infections here's a group of non-CF patients who had who still had documented infections but just they didn't have CF and then here are healthy controls this is just to show you that the responses were very re reliable from chip to chip and if you start looking carefully at this you'll start to see a pattern emerge certain features show up over and over again so that pair there is there it's there it's there it's there and there and there and there same it's those two spots are the same protein everybody's there on duplicate they show up repeatedly that's a sign that that particular protein is what we call immunodominant and if you look at um, patients in columns and antigens in rows um, you'll see that these top 12 or so antigens show up in numerous patients and so this is the group of, of proteins that we should be looking at to 
think about developing a vaccine. Now, there's a couple of things to remember. First of all, um, you can't make a vaccine until you know that those proteins actually induce a protective response. So we haven't done that part yet. The second thing is that no single protein worked for everybody. Uh, it turned out that to get everybody, you had to get a mixture of a few proteins. And I think that's going to be a common, in fact, I know that's going to be a common theme moving forward in developing biomarkers, is that it's going to be rare that a single biomarker will work for everybody. Eventually, you're going to need multiple biomarkers um, because different people have different responses. So I hope you got a very good overview of how this fascinating technology nucleic acid programmable protein array was developed. The kind of thought process of generating these resources especially protein without having the protein expression and purification was definitely one of the revolutionary concepts in the proteomics field. The Napa chemistry was explained by Dr. Lebert in detail and you are also now familiar with what are the advantages of using this technology platform. Of course, there are challenges in miniaturizing these assays, these features to do the high density printing, but those were overcome with many innovative ways and Dr. Lemaire has talked to you about high density printing, the new capture chemistries, the different modified ways of DNA preparation and the improved detection technologies which have really progressed the initial versions of NAPA technology to the very latest much more easy and reproducible and high throughput NAPA based platforms. I hope now you are very convinced that using self free expression microarrays could overcome many limitations of protein expression and purification. You need not to limit yourself to express and purify each protein of interest and large number of proteins to be purified before you can do a protein micro experiment. Even if you have cDNA for the genes of interest, you can still do the protein micro based experiments and NAPA could be one of the very uh, powerful technologies to do these kind of experiments. I hope you got some understanding of this novel technology and a basics of some applications which could be performed using NAPA arrays. Thank you very much. Thank you.